we said that it's very important on day one, and I'm sure you did something similar, on day one to have an honest conversation with our students, uh, acknowledge the emotional state of uh, our students and display compassion, because this is all a new experience for us. And it's very difficult even for us, you know, uh, with you know, older adults to understand and cope and, and adjust to the new realities. But it's even more difficult for younger people that we find in our, in our classrooms. Uh, so there's a lot of anxiety at the personal level. There's a lot of anxiety, stress, uncertainty, and hardships caused, caused by uh, the financial uh, situation that their families may be facing. At Georgia State, an urban university, we have a very unique uh, uh, body of students uh, in the sense that we, we have a lot of folks who come from a certain socioeconomic background, very modest socioeconomic backgrounds. Uh, so these are kids who typically have two, three part-time jobs. Uh, they've lost those. Their families are suffering and, and all that. So we need to understand that. And then there's the societal, societal tension, heightened racial tensions, uh, obviously call for greater inclusion, equity, and diversity in, in our culture. So we have to acknowledge that as well, because we are downtown Atlanta, and we see uh, all kinds of protests uh, almost on a daily basis. Uh, the third uh, cause of anxiety is of course uh, coping with learning online, which uh, is also insurmountable almost. Uh, we have difficult time uh, teaching online. Imagine our students yeah. learning online. And many of them, uh, this is new for them and they're having uh, difficulties. In fact, we just did uh, at the university a recent survey and what we are hearing from students is that they are overwhelmed with the uh, workload and the complexity of scheduling. They find it very difficult to keep up. And this is perhaps due to, to initial intentions on their part, optimistic intentions that they can manage uh, so many courses, as many courses as they can. Uh, but what we're finding, perhaps sometimes due to lack of discipline, because nobody's going to tell you to come to class anymore. There's not the peer pressure. You know, you're teaching online. Uh, you have to motivate yourself to get up and, and do the work, uh, attend the classes, and, and keep up with the assignments. <clears throat> so we find our students also less engaged with the material, and they also talk about lack of contact with their professors and, and, and fellow students. So these are real concerns that we need to think about and, and, and adjust to. Uh, so we are talking dynamically today, uh, in fact, uh, uh, constant discussion of how we can accommodate uh, these new circumstances and, and at least acknowledge uh, the emotional uh, state and, and difficulties our students are facing and alleviate as best as we can uh, the anxiety and reassure and provide uh, uh, a different perspective, a long-term perspective, because we need to remind them that this is a blip. Uh, it, mm -hmm. Things will look up, things will look better. Each of our students will have 30, 40 years of successful career. So if they can just use this time to do one thing. And what I tell my students is, is what the businesses are doing now. The key word right now in business is resilience. <clears throat> Companies are trying to build resilient operations, resilient supply chains, resilient decision-making, resilient brands, resilient products. So uh, when it comes to resilience, which is of course the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties uh, and, and accommodate adverse circumstances and, and a process of adapting well in the face of adversity and a positive outlook, positive adaptation in the context of significant adversity. The very first thing that our students need to do 
this is what I tell them, is to build a resilient character. Uh, because this is going to serve them not just today, but throughout their careers as well. So this becomes, this means, you know, problem solving skills, uh, self-control, self-discipline, positive outlook on life, optimism, uh, and, and, a, and a grit and hard work. Uh, so they need to have a resilient ca character, personality to overcome the challenges. And these are real challenges. I also tell them that it's very important to build a resilient uh, resume. So this is also a time and opportunity for them to add to their skill base. And John will talk about some of the intangible skills and, and, and soft skills that we keep talking about. Uh, but this is very important time for the students to build the skills which will introduce them and make them more marketable in the new economy. What is the new economy? It's the digital economy, digital marketplace. So what kind of skills are needed to be successful? Because even though the job market looks very pessimistic right now, there are many companies and in many industries that are thriving. Companies, we talk to folks in Atlanta, we talk to a lot of business people, what we hear from them, senior business executives, that there is a real gap in skills. Uh, what they need and what they get from the recent graduates do not match. So there is a big gap. So what we need to tell our students is that they need analytical thinking, programming skills, math skills, quantitative analysis in order to make themselves more marketable because going forward, the jobs are in areas such as predictive analytics, cybersecurity, data analytics, FinTech, financial technology, uh, automation, cognitive AI, machine learning, uh, and, and cloud architecture and platforms, uh, platform businesses, including gaming. So there are real opportunities for our students to supplement their skills so that they will make an easier transition to the new economy. This is very important. I say to our students, it's not just sufficient that you take your traditional business courses, but you need to think about proactively building your skill set so that you are a contemporary, uh, skillful, uh, and much more uh, ready uh, for the digital economy. So uh, these are some of the ideas I think initially it's very important to share with our students. Uh, obviously, we talk a lot about in, in teaching international business at this particular point in time, we talk a lot about the pandemic and disruptions. We remind our students uh, that uh, disruptions have always been there. Uh, but this one, of course, because we, we talk about technological disruption, wars, natural disasters, uh, trade uh, tensions, protectionism, public hostility against multinationals and so on. They always been there. Uh, but this one is more devastating in terms of magnitude, intensity, scope and reach and expected duration. We still don't know when we will get back to some sort of a normal. Uh, so the irony uh, about globalization that we teach in our introductory course in international business is that it actually contributed to the rapid dissemination uh, of the virus, rapid infection, right? Because the 1918, the last pandemic, uh, you, you, it was nothing compared to this one because it was a different time. Now, because of the mobility of the people, it took just a few weeks for the entire world to, to get a taste of this uh, uh, pandemic, uh, apparently. So this is truly a black swan event and a, and a devastating one. So we, again, it's important that companies need to adjust. Resilience is, the, is what they're looking for. And, and it applies at the personal level as well. Then we talk about impact on globalization and international business. And here I may share just a 
few slides. I, I promise I will not share a lot because I like to see you right in front of me. But let me just share a few ideas here. And uh, let me see, that didn't work, did it? It came up, but then it went away. Okay. How about now? Yep, we see the PowerPoint. Thank you, Hannah. So uh, uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, something also we, we talk a lot about, uh, that the fact that globalization takes place in phases, there are ups and downs, and we definitely find ourselves in the, uh, in the contemporary economy in a, in a different phase of globalization, which also suggests that uh, that is the, uh, that is, that is where, we, where, where we are. In terms of the impact, uh, we talk about, uh, uh, this is actually from uh, the, the way uh, globalization is defined by McKinsey. Uh, these are the dimensions of globalization. McKinsey and uh, McKinsey has this uh, annual update called uh, uh, Global Connectedness Index. And they look at five uh, dimensions of globalization, uh, trade and merchandise goods uh, and trade and services, the flow of money, capital, FDI, the flow, flow of people and flow of data and technology. So uh, this is to indicate that Yes, some of these flows, some of these dimensions or facets of internationalization, globalization have been impacted. For example, what we see significant, uh, relatively speaking, significant reduction in the trade of goods and a significant increase in the trade of services. And we, this started, this trend started earlier on, but even more so today. Uh, and certainly if you look at the flow of people, definitely has slowed down substantially. But when we look at data or technology, we see no slowdown there. And I also share with them another index of uh, connectedness. Uh, I don't know if you have seen this one. DHL also uh, calculates and shares every year uh, their, con con uh, their global connectedness index. Uh, this is the 2019 uh, update. You see in the red line there, a significant uh, increase uh, in the flow information, data uh, and technology and ideas as well. Whereas the others uh, are, are growing modestly, but they are growing. <coughs> this uh, of course does not have the 2020 data, in fact, 2019 data, but you can imagine what's happening there. Uh, uh, again, uh, you won't see much growth in, in the movement of people, whether they are tourists or international students or migrants, uh, but you will see significant. Even this day, uh, actually, one of the things we share, there's quite a bit of FDI activity. Uh, and, and the United States uh, continues to be the uh, number one recipient of FDI. Uh, so, uh, a lot of interesting, useful tools. One of the things I always uh, share with my students is a, is a very uh, useful knowledge portal, of course, is Global Edge. And you should definitely introduce your students to that at the beginning of the class, because it's a great resource. I also tell them if they want to have a strong footing in, in business practice, that they should uh, continue to follow uh, uh, McKinsey uh, Knowledge Portal and McKinsey Quarterly because they are really the, some of the best tools, uh, resources in terms of understanding uh, current trends, contemporary trends in international business. So some of the things we share with them uh, is to how the pandemic is changing globalization then in terms of these five uh, dimensions also uh, some, some, some new trends. Uh, this is definitely uh, happening. The first two we already talked about, but the third trend that we're seeing is the relatively less importance of labor cost arbitrage. 
In other words, uh, fewer companies are going international uh, in order to take advantage of low cost labor uh, for several reasons. First of all, labor has become a small portion of the total cost of manufacturing. Secondly, there's been some leveling. Uh, so the emerging markets have built up their economies, standards of living have gone up, uh, therefore wages have gone down. Uh, so uh, the difference between advanced economy and emerging economy uh, labor costs is not as what it used to be. And then thirdly, technology, uh, uh, of course, has meant that uh, labor is not necessarily. Uh, so uh, that's something also we talk about. And, and we talk about the importance of R&D and innovation becoming more important in today's competitive uh, um, marketplace. Companies are spending more on R&D in intangible assets. In fact, assets such as brands, uh, company reputation, software, intellectual property have become much more important to global competitiveness. Uh, and then the other trend we're seeing is that trade is becoming more concentrated within regions. In fact, uh, this is partly in due to the rise of emerging markets. So Argentinians trading <clears throat> Uh, Chinese trading with, with Singaporeans and, and, and on. Uh, so this is, uh, these are some of the trends that we talk about in terms of how the global pandemic has, has uh, affected uh, the, what we teach uh, uh, in, in, in uh, international business, uh, certainly. And we remind them that uh, uh, the, the, the globalization, internationalization of the firm is of course inevitable. Uh, just look at the share of the market world GDP that the US accounts for, less than a quarter. So that's an imperative for companies to seek growth opportunities abroad. I will not share, uh, I will not share this, but maybe this one, uh, this is a quiz for you. And, and some of you have seen this uh, before in my talks. Uh, so the question I ask my students, what are these folks doing on a remote mountaintop in Northern England? Any uh, guesses? Just a hint, they are not catching butterflies. Anybody care to guess, make a guess? Fresh air. Fresh air. Good. <laughs> They're in the air farming business. So this kind of business has evolved over the past uh, decade or so. So you have European, uh, I mean, you have uh, US companies also in this business, uh, you know, clean air, clean oxygen and, and, and uh, Rocky Mountains. You have Canadians, you have Australians, New Zealanders, UK firms and so on, selling fresh air by packing them in canisters like this and marketing them in congested cities uh, where uh, mothers of young kids uh, are willing to pay $15 and more for a canister like this so that the kids can breathe fresh air. So this talks a little bit about uh, uh, business opportunities, a little bit about ingenuity of uh, entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial drive, and also uh, globalization. Uh, so, I, I see my time is, uh, is, uh, is getting very uh, short here. Then one of the things I talk early on in, in terms of discussing globalization and internationalization of the firms, apart from making a distinction between those two, of course, internationalization, we speak of firms, globalization, we speak of industries and, and countries. So uh, we, we do these things and you will have these slides as well in your packet. Uh, so I will not, uh, I will just slow down here and maybe stop sharing and, uh, and see if there are any comments, uh, questions uh, we can respond to before we turn to John uh, and his topics. 
I'll just jump in to say thank you for sharing the resources. I really look forward to this. Um, it will be quite timely in preparing for spring courses. And so um, all those links will be really helpful. I know that um, your, your programs are offering great webinars frequently and I try to attend as much as possible, but this is just so compact um, and I appreciate the package. Well, thank you for sharing the, uh, your opinion, Karen. I appreciate it. Uh, definitely uh, do keep track of our webinars. They're also record recorded. So you have the opportunity to view these very, uh, you know, timely and I think uh, relatively short 50 minute videos from, uh, you know, master teachers, educators, business uh, executives that we have. We have also the uh, newsletter, uh, occasional newsletter, monthly newsletters on IB teaching, pedagogy. So if you're not on the mailing list, please let us know. We'll put you on the mailing list. And I will finally put in a word for tomorrow's uh, keynote speaker, uh, Ahmed Bozer, who is uh, uh, a key uh, executive that we consult uh, frequently. He is actually on the uh, Georgia State Cyber Advisory Board. He recently retired from uh, Coca-Cola as the president for international, uh, that is uh, the rest of the world. Uh, uh, he was in charge of the world uh, uh, activities for Coca-Cola outside of the United States. So he is a very articulate, very thoughtful executive. You will definitely find his comments to be thought-provoking, inspiring. So do tune in tomorrow, I think at uh, 11 o'clock for his uh, keynote. So with that, I will turn to... Uh, Yes, uh, Laura, uh, please. I can ask it later if you want, but uh, something you just mentioned, the idea that uh, this backlash is, is temporary, it, it's, it's a blimp and, and, and then, and then it, will, it will go away. We had a good discussion in my class with undergraduate students. Many of them said this is not really, they don't believe this is temporary, but this is another phase. We had the discussion about phases of globalization. And they said this is a phase that's going to last just as long as some of the other phases. And there were some good arguments uh, on both sides. So I wanted to see kind of your, your idea about the expected timeline of this, what we see as a backlash. Uh, who knows? <laughs> I think your guess is uh, best, uh, as good as mine. Uh, Ahmed may say something about that. He's very thoughtful. He reads a lot. He talks to a lot of fellow business executives as well. But I think we're talking about uh, 2004. Uh, when we uh, speak of getting back to some sort <coughs> we consider normal. normal, normal. Uh, so that's another three years away, unfortunately. Uh, it will, it will, it has you, but you're very right. This is definitely uh, a major uh, new phase that uh, we're not familiar, we're not ready uh, to deal with, but uh, I think agility uh, and resilience uh, and, and, and utilizing this time productively uh, so that we are better, better ready for a lot of uncertainty down the road is what we're talking about. Now, there are a lot of uh, companies and industries that are prospering. Uh, so uh, the, the, one of the things I have not mentioned, but you'll see it in my uh, handout materials, is that this uh, pandemic has not affected uh, every company and every industry equally. And of course, every country equally, not, not from there. There's a lot of what we call left behind. In fact, the poverty has gone up significantly, unfortunately. One of the major things, one of the mega trends that happened, this was already in place, is the inequality of income and inequality of opportunity around the world, not just in our country, in the United States, but this is significant. Now we put 70 million people more into the ranks of poverty uh, due to the pandemic. Worldwide, there is 750 million people in poverty, in extreme poverty. So this has made, uh, unfortunately, I mean, in recent years, not just a pandemic, tax policies and so on, uh, the gap between the affluent and the poor very wide. And the middle class has shrunk 
in the United States as well as in some of the Western European countries. So there are a lot of negative trends, adverse trends that's happening uh, along with globalization uh, that we need to keep track of. So these are huge problems uh, that our societies need to deal with. And we hope just that there will be a good leadership in, in charge of our, our countries and economies in place to deal with these. So I will, uh, I will stop there. And John, I think you are ready. In fact, uh, you've been ready for some time. I know you cannot wait. <laughs> thank you, Tamir. So, thank you. Volcanoes. Whenever I think about university settings, campuses, it reminds me of volcanoes. Why do I say that? We can drive by university structures, we can drive by volcanoes for years, decades, centuries, and just looking at the outside, see very little change. However, volcanologists, when they climb up on top of volcanoes and put out all of their instruments, they can sense a lot of dynamic changes going on inside, and at times can even predict lava flows and explosions of volcanoes. Perhaps the same can be said about universities. Universities today, the academic community, is a huge business. It's estimated that right now, the, it is one of the major industries in the United States. Over $400 billion a year is spent in the university environment. There are over 2,400 universities and colleges in the United States, and they employ over 3 million people, both professors as well as administrative staff. What will the future look like for academia? Well, we all, what we all know is that we really don't know and it's gonna be different. But just as we see with uh, the lava flow that occurs in volcanoes, it's difficult to project what the future will look like. We know that there will be massive destruction and we also know we can't put the lava back into the volcano. I think we're experiencing the same in academia today. Good morning, my name is John. I'm delighted to be with you today. I am not a professor, I'm not an academic. As Tamir mentioned, uh, I'm a practitioner, a business person. So what I'd like you to do for the next few minutes while we're together is to change your hat from that of being a professor to one of being a market researcher or an observer of the environment. I have four goals today. One, to review what are some of those environmental factors that are beginning or have had a big impact on academia today. Secondly, what's the growing role and change in stakeholder involvement? We rarely, those of us that are involved in academia, don't always tend to think of stakeholders. Third, understand what the needs of students and employers are. Tamir touched on that, but there's a dramatic shift and change in the needs of students today and employers. And how is we as academics fit into that future? What is our value proposition moving forward? You know, if, if you're like a lot of people who say, I can't wait for a year or 18 months when uh, all this is gonna change and everything is gonna go back to normal. Well, a lot, of this, a lot of the statistics out there and observations as we look at it with our market research app are going to show that indeed it's not gonna go back the same way. We have a chance, an opportunity to be part of that solution or to be part of a problem. Let's, let me quickly run through some of those observations, okay? Number one, we know the rate of tuition increase has been crippling for students and for parents. Over the, the last uh, uh, 20 years, that has, that the rate of tuition increases has been more than double that of the rate of inflation. And that today, uh, tuition is eight times the wage increases over the last 25 years, according to Forbes. Secondly, student loans are staggering. 44 million Americans have student loans exceeding $1.6 trillion. Can, is this a sustainable business model? Uh, students are actually right now suing their universities for rebates, discounts, and refunds because of the shift from online campus to, I mean, from uh, on campus to online. In fact, the University of Wisconsin systems, 
13 campuses have already refunded $78 million to students in tuition. We see also a tremendous decrease in the number of international students because of visa issues. And we also see a, a decreased number in MBA programs. I was surprised, actually startled to learn that over the last five years, 100 in-person MBA programs have been shut down in the United States. Let me say that again. 100 MBA programs in the United States have been shut down in, in the last five years. That's over 10% of the programs. Now, many of those have shifted to online offerings because of the reduced tuition expenses. Teaching positions, I think this is a really, really important trend. I was reading some recent articles and it pointed out that today, only 27% of the new teaching positions that are offered are being offered for tenure track positions. Three out of four positions today that are being offered offer positions for adjunct professors or for uh, part-time professors, a staggering number and one that appears to be increasing as we move forward. There is an overabundance of adjunct professors. <clears throat> they work for low wages, very low wages. In fact, it's estimated that the average adjunct professor which who gets paid, she or he gets paid to teach a course, not by the hour or, or for the semester, receives a compensation of about $3,500 to $5,000 to teach a course. Very scary, right? There is tremendous pressure from our friends in university administration to find cost efficiencies. And one of the things they have concentrated on is cutting teaching costs is one of the easy ways to reduce costs. And again, we see a big shift to adjunct professors and to online education. Another thing we have observed is there is an exponential growth for not-for-profit, cost-effective, accredited online education. This is not profit universities, but not-for-profit. And I'll share a few thoughts with, with you on that in a minute. The other thing is, and Tamir alluded to this, there has been a profound impact by the fourth industrial revolution and the need for new graduates to have an entirely different skill set. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Combined with that, we have uh, the impact <clears throat> of the pandemic, the coronavirus pandemic that has a profound impact on all of us. <clears throat> in fact, you'll see on the slide here that Hannah's gonna put up <clears throat> in a recent survey of over 500 students, 75% reported significantly higher levels of anxiety, depression, and stress. There are concomitant surveys that show professors are experiencing the same, that most professors, the majority, are also struggling with this new transition and how we go. So let's now shift to one other thought. We've looked at two major impacts <clears throat> on the volcanic flow, the lava flow occurring at universities. We looked at those 12 dimensions. We looked at the impact of the pandemic. And the third area I'd like to touch on is that which revolves around stakeholders, a third complexity in the perfect storm that we're all experiencing. What I'd like you to do now, if you have a pad and a pencil, is write down very quickly, who are the stakeholders most involved from your perspective in academia today? You have 20 seconds. Who are the stakeholders that you consider impacting today? Okay, everybody ready? Hannah's gonna now pop up on the screen here, a survey. And I, what, what I'd like us to each do is to uh, uh, mark on that survey, those answers which you wrote down or mentally, if you didn't have a pad and a pencil in front of you, write down. Did you write down students? Did you write down professors? Did you write down university administration, government, parents, employers, or identify some other? And then hit submit, hit the submit button. And in a few seconds, Hannah will give us the results of what we found, what we all participated.
Okay, everybody have a submit button hit. Hannah, what do we see? What, what did the audience show? Wow, I've got quite a, hey, everybody got just about uh, fairly consistent. So yes, 93% for students, the number one response as key stakeholders. Professors, obviously, second. University administration, 59%. The government, of course, has a profound impact because they provide a lot of the funding, whether in the form of direct state grants to universities or in the form of student loans. But parents, 43, 44%, and employers, 67%. So we see that there are a lot more people today than say a, a decade or two ago that are impacting what we do and how we conduct that activity. So what we see here on slide 10, again, is a list of those. So we have seen there are some seismic changes in industry as well as in academia. Let me give you a few examples of what the potential future for academia may hold. Let's just look at a couple of industries and see what cost pressures have done. If we look at the brokerage trade industry, 20, 30 years ago, one, if they wanted to buy stocks or bonds, had to go to a specialist at a brokerage firm. And a typical trade might cost $200. Over the last 20 years or so, with the advent of advanced computer technology, software systems, artificial intelligence, we can trade, make brokerage trades now for zero or close to zero. The cost factors in that industry drove from $200 to close to zero. The same is true in the pharmaceutical industry. When branded drugs were first made, very few people used generics. But over the last 30 years, there's been a growing trend and stress to use generic drugs. Today, the cost to purchase generic drugs, in some cases equivalent, some people say, to the branded drug, has driven the price down 85% within a period of 12 to 15 months. So we see the brokerage trades, $200 to zero, pharmaceuticals 85 from 100% down to 15% of costs. Same thing with tax returns. 25, 30 years ago, tax returns were predominantly done by accountants. And then a bright company called H&R Block came on the market and what did they do? They found out that, you know what? It's really not quite as hard as it seems with a little software, and a little bit of training, we can train high school graduates to do what before skilled accountants needed to do, it became genericized. And today the cost is almost down to zero with the introduction of software products like TurboTax. Well, today over two thirds of Americans do their own income tax using TurboTax or similar products. So again, from hundreds of dollars down to maybe $25, $30. The another big example might be textbooks. For many, many decades and years, we've seen a significant increase in the price of textbooks, just like we have seen with tuition, really at getting out of control and one with which the market would no longer bear. And what do we see as, an, as a result of that? We've seen a dramatic shift from paper hardbound textbooks that maybe cost $250 retail a few years ago, now being able to be rented online for one fourth that price. And it, and it has impacted each of these industries. If you take major textbook publishers like Pearson or McGraw-Hill, <clears throat> 20 years ago, Pearson stock traded for $38 a share. This week, it was down to $7 a share. Um, because again, of the tremendous pressure on costs for, for items that traditionally have now shifted from being uh, labor intensive to now being considered more generically uh, processing capabilities. Is the same true in academia? And you don't have this slide either. How many people have heard of Southern New Hampshire University? Have you heard of Southern New Hampshire University? Southern New Hampshire University, I see ads on my TV every single day. Uh, it's, a, it's a university that is accredited, regionally accredited not by the AACSB, but by the ACBSP, whatever that is. They, they, they offer bachelor's degrees. It's primarily 98% online degrees. They have not raised tuition since 2012. Static tuition for the last eight years. A bachelor's degree costs about $37,000.
And in fact, this year, they gave free tuition to all freshmen. 20, 20 years ago, they had 8,000 students. Three years ago, they had 100,000 students. In 2019, they had 132,000 students. It's staffed by over 6,000 adjunct professors. What's the quality of the education? I don't know, but you know what? They have a 68% graduation rate. The average starting salary for new graduates is high, $45,800. And they focus on traditional course content. So I think these are very, very important things to consider. And as Martin Luther King famously said, every crisis is both its dangers and its opportunities. Each can spell either salvation or it can spell doom. It's up for us as, as academics to decide how we wanna get involved. Our new generation of students go to college and we really need to understand this for two major reasons. One, to get a better job, 86% said that's critical. And number two, to make more money. And in fact, the top four responses from the CIRP study, which is given by UCLA, UCLA each year, over 250,000 freshmen take this survey every single year. Since it began 50 years ago, over 15 million freshmen have taken this study. Over 1,900 schools participate. So the odds are freshmen in your school take this study. So the four key things, they want to learn more about career relevant content, not traditional content. And they wanna get the kind of training and skills to help prepare themselves for A, to get a better job and to B, make more money. Public corporations. Why do public corporations exist? Very simply, and I'll answer this in one sentence. Public corporations really exist for one reason, and that is to make profit, and they're owned by their stockholders. Why do companies employ, and why do companies hire employees? Well, number one, this is really important to understand, and, and I've interviewed several thousand potential new, I mean, new college graduates during my career and hired probably 400 people in my career. Companies hate to hire employees. Employees are cost centers. Let me, let me repeat that. Companies hate to hire employees and virtually every employee that is hired is viewed, out, viewed at by executive management as a cost center. They are hired for one of two reasons, one of three reasons. People hire employees because they believe they can increase sales for the company. Number two, they hire employees because they believe that the skills that they have and the training that they have can decrease costs within the company, all with the end goal of increasing profit. So let's take a quick look at, at your current syllabus. And let's take a quick look at what do you have in your learning objectives? So Sarah is now going to put up survey question number two. And I'd ask you to take a second to check one of the boxes. My learning outcomes on my current syllabus are focused primarily on the course subject content, majority on the subject content with a minor focus on soft skills development, 50-50 between traditional content and soft skills, or majority on soft skills with a minor on subject content, or fully on soft skills, which today most closely represents your syllabus design. Okay, please click submit and Hannah will tell us what, what our survey showed. Ah, equal weight on subject content and soft skills development. That's terrific, that's about 55%. And in second place, we see the majority of subject content with a minor focus on soft skills development. As Tamir pointed out in during his presentation, there is a growing shift because of the fourth industrial revolution in the needs of what we want to do moving forward in the classroom. Thank you. You can close that out. Thank you. 
Anna, can you take, uh, take that slide down, please? Whoops, okay, hold on. Okay, I'm gonna skip this next section on content observations, uh, but I'm gonna go to slide 25, Anna, if you could put that up. So some observations on, on content, slide 25 here. Fourth, four observations very quickly on content. What we know about content, traditional course content, is that the knowledge that is communicated in the classroom is rapidly depleted. We know from the early, the early works of uh, Herman Ebbinghaus uh, that over a very short period of time, we forget knowledge. Obsolescence, the, the rate of change is tremendous. Thirdly, it, today, unlike 10, 20, 30 years ago, knowledge can be obtained everywhere. And fourthly, is relevance. Is the knowledge that we're communicating in the classroom relevant for future employment? And if not, you know, what should we do about it? Slide 27 kind of shows that there's a dramatic shift, as Tamir pointed out, in what is needed. The in advent of the fourth industrial revolution has basically eliminated, for people like me that hire new college graduates, eliminated many, even the majority of first line work. Before, many people did a lot of labor manually, but today, uh, as new college graduates, certain skills have now been automated, uh, eliminating a lot of that job, a lot of those jobs. And so the people we're hiring need to do something different. You know, today, soft skills are the crucial determinant in people being hired or not. And there's this tremendous shift in, in, in these kinds of things. Okay. We look at shut slide 29, Hannah. A recent study said, well, how well are we doing as academics in preparing people for the marketplace? They asked, and this is a survey done uh, by the AAC and you, uh, the American, the Association of American Colleges and Universities. <clears throat> they asked over a thousand employers and over a thousand students. They asked, what degree of preparation have I received in my education to become employed? And what we can see here in these critical soft skills of oral communication, teaming, written communications, decision-making, ethical judgment, critical thinking, and analytical skills, employers rated the people that they were interviewing, only one out of three was ready to go to work. They were significantly lacking in these skill sets. Students, on the other hand, were far more optimistic. Two out of three said, I'm ready, I have these skills. So there's a gap here, an opportunity. And so what really presents us today is moving forward. We know the, the, the lava has been flowing down the, the volcano for some time now. Moving forward, with, based on these dimensions that we just looked at, based on the role, the, the impact of online education and the shift to less expensive online education, uh, less online education, <clears throat> and, the, and it's being perceived at a growing rate by employers as quality education. What are we gonna do in the classroom to create a value proposition? How are we going to differentiate ourselves from low cost, not-for-profit university academic institutions? and add value to prepare students. So the challenge really is upon us. We look at career relevant teaching as the new challenge coming out of the pandemic in the next year or two. And a lot of this data seems to indicate that not just teaching course content, but having an understanding of career relevant content combined with teaching of appropriate teaching of skills is going to be critical for success of students in the future. Many of us say, well, you know what? It's not my job as a professor to teach skills. There are other people on campus that are, are responsible for that. Yet many professors take the opposite approach and saying, I need to be able to do this and, and help my students get ready. Okay, so there are a large number of different career skills that students need to work on. So the challenge I think that presents all of us is to consciously, as we're beginning to develop syllabi for the future, 
is to look at including career relevant content and intangible soft skills. You look at 30, a lot of our syllabi, you look at slide 35, Hannah, look a lot like this. You, the typical reaction from students is yikes, and they're usually pretty long. So there is an opportunity for students to, and for professors to refocus. And if we take the time to look at what are students' actual physical goals? What do they want to do in, in their careers as they move forward? And then find a way to link their career goals with the learning outcomes within our syllabi. There's a tremendous future. In the 2019 program at Georgia State University, the cyber program, at the end, there were over 100 professors that attended. The two key recommendations that those professors had were for future programs was, can you shift the program to concentrate on two key things? How can we as professors improve engagement in the classroom? And secondly, we need help with syllabus development. Next week, next Thursday, I'll be joined by Elizabeth Napier and Sarah Ku, who have taken up that challenge and have helped to develop what is, we believe, a breakthrough in syllabus design, the student goal-centered syllabus. They will be sharing with you the results. You will see student reactions, improved excitement and engagement in the classroom, and they'll also be showing you the methodology they use to develop similar but very distinct design differences in the development of the syllabi. Thank you very much. Tamir. Well, thank you so much, uh, John. That was uh, outstanding. That was uh, thought provoking, uh, very timely and inspiring. And we so look forward to next week's webinar. Uh, I think you see a lot of uh, thumbs up there. Next week webinar, uh, Elizabeth is here and Sarah are here too young uh educators who are innovators also in the classroom and have uh have looked at syllabi and they came up with a very different design uh so that it becomes syllabus to old fashioned boring syllabus becomes a dynamic uh, document and something that inspires the students and the students feel like uh, keeping up on a, on a daily basis so i highly recommend that you tune in to, to that webinar next week. Uh, John, that was great. It was great to get those perspectives from a practitioner point of view. Business, international business is definitely an applied field. And what we uh, see now, the gap between the skills uh, that we offer to the employers and what they're expecting, there's a big uh, vacuum there. There's a big gap there. So we need to really try very hard and help our students in the process so that become uh, more marketable and they have rewarding careers, not necessarily a, a surprise when they join the workforce and realize that they have to catch up very quickly. So with that, we'll turn to the classroom and Ilke is here. She cannot wait also to share some of her best practices, especially with the use of digital uh, tools in the classroom. Ilke, I mentioned, she's just an amazing, uh, innovative teacher. She, speaking of engagement that John talked about, which is, is the number one concern for us, all of us, how to engage the contemporary student and keep their attention for 50 minutes, uh, sometimes 120 minutes, sometimes longer in the evening classes. But Ilke, is one very dynamic, energetic uh, young colleague who has uh, a lot of experience in doing that very successfully. So Ilke, thank you for joining us this afternoon. We look forward to your ideas and I know you have that handout uh, that you will also share with everybody. Thank you very much. Hello everybody, thanks for joining us. Um, so today I want to talk uh, a couple of um, social media tools that you can use uh, in uh, at our uh, in our classes. 
So let me share my screen with you. Okay. So here is uh, the aim of using the social media tools. Why we are using the, all the social media tools? Like uh, to make the, uh, the class a little bit more attractive and fun and to create a wow effect by students. Because I mean, they are young generation and they are involved in their, you know, uh, smartphones and uh, tablets. They wanna, you know, see uh, something from what they use. So it's a good idea to integrate such tools and I'm doing uh, this for a long time and I got really good feedback. So students uh, think, oh, this is a fun class. So that increases their motivation and their cl class participation. So uh, now today I have the opportunity to show these uh, tools, some of them, I don't have time to show all of them, but some of them uh, lively with you. So here um, it starts with Flipboard. Flipboard meaning it starts with source. So I have a, uh, you know, like ranking system. So I use different tools in different uh, classes and in different semesters. I don't use all of them except three of them uh, in every class because, you know, the students are talking to each other if you use all the time the same tool, it gets boring. The aim is to make the class exciting. So the three main tools I use, three, three uh, tools that I use always is the Flipboard, Pocket and Pinterest. So they are connected to each other. So one thing I do uh, in my classes is uh, use the, you know, uh, real uh, business news, real world experiences. So there is a, a information from the textbook. I always uh, support this textbook information with an uh, with an uh, updated uh, with an updated uh, business news. So where do you get this business news? We know there are a lot of sources like Google News, Apple News, or the you know, individual newspapers, journals. But one app is really, I mean, nice, especially if you uh, look at this app uh, in, on, on a tablet. Here, uh, we don't have that functionality because I'm showing this on the, uh, on the web in the web browser. But in, in on tablet, it's actually uh, gives you the feeling as if you are reading a newspaper, like because of the interface. So here you see is the, all my uh, topics that I'm interested. So even you know you can find uh, something a good uh, uh, class materials from a topic related to a fashion, for example because there are articles related to international business or international marketing. For example, you know, uh, when I'm just clicking on a random topic, like uh, this is uh, a news source. So what is here? There are some, I cannot uh, write. So there are some, you know, news so, um, for example, I thought I think this is a, I mean, an interesting, you know, uh, interesting topic which uh, which suits to the related chapter, but with what I discussed this uh, this uh, week. So I click on it. So that's uh, great. So now here, you know. When I look at that, that's great, but I should keep it so that I can remember to use later uh, or later uh, in the week or to embed it in the in, in my in my uh, uh, lecture slides. So what I do, I uh, save it to my personal library, which is Pocket, as you can see here. So how do I save it? Pocket 
which means getpocket.com, actually, the uh, full name, uh, provides such browser uh, buttons. So here you click on that, it says, does this page set. And here you can even add uh, some text to uh, make it the search easier later. Like say, so this is a market entry related. See, I already have some existing uh, 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 text here, like put it there market entry. It's not market entry, but still. Yeah. So now it is in pocket. So I go to my pocket and voila, it immediately pops up there. You even the, uh, don't need to, you know, uh, uh, update the page. Here, that is so cool. Like uh, I am, you know, uh, like uh, I said that five, five hours later, I will sit on my uh, computer and will add uh, the article in my slides. What I do, I click on one art article, so this is the always with you, you know, but I always click the with original because pictures, images are very important. Students love images, love videos. So here, that's an image, great. I can use that. So what do I do here? So now I'm gonna share this. Sorry about that. I'm gonna share this with my students. I summarize this article on a slide, but to refer the whole article, I use Pinterest. You know, everybody knows Pinterest. Many people use Pinterest. Pinterest is the, you know, like we use it for hobbies, but I use it for my classes. So as you can see here, I have boards for each chapter, as you can see, like this is, like for international business, the bottom is for international marketing, but inter they are, you know, um, ex uh, interchangeable actually from my perspective. That's great. So what I do, this is, now I'm gonna save it to my Pinterest. Pinterest also provides this browser button for every browser. You click on that browser button. It loads the image. I pick the image, you know, which is on the article because that refers to the article because I put this image also in the on the slide so that students can easily go there and find the article. You click on it. Next. And it asks you which board you want to add this. That related board is digital business slash digital marketing. You click on that, save it. So that's great. Now your uh, students repository, digital business has your new article. So um, when the student goes to this board, we can say folder. So it, the student sees not only that article, but the article that I added uh for the for the earlier semester and then they are you know uh they here i create a story about that uh about that uh, certain uh topic or chapter so that's so cool i mean that's so easy you can click on that mm -hmm. and here is the thing if they click on that they immediately goes to the uh goes to the source mm -hmm. the real article so this is very useful it is useful not only for students, but for yourself. You know, that is you stay organized. And based on my experience, you know, I mean, staying organized is very important. And my students uh, uh, usually uh, mention that in the uh, student ev instructor evaluation, she's so organized because they see it, everything like flows. So everything is connected. So this uh, Pinterest, as I uh, showed you, it just includes the articles that I discuss in my classes. So I don't, I don't throw a bunch of articles there. I just throw it there, the articles that we discuss 
me means me and my students discuss uh, in the uh, classes. So I also use a Facebook page that is a different brand positioning for me. I use the Facebook page, I call that knowledge. So like Car Kardash doctor. So I couldn't come up with a more original uh, name for that title. So because why it is knowledge, I always say uh, my students at the beginning, at the very first class of the semester, knowledge is power. You need to learn. Your aim is not only to pass this class, your aim is to learn because if you uh, know more, you are more uh, cool. So if you have more intellectual uh, knowledge, then there is a possibility that uh, the, you, you are hired because that is what I think the employer also looks for, for the students. So this knowledge page it just includes, you know, maps or like TikTok videos related to the to our uh, to our uh, class. So that's interesting. I tell students look at that, and sometimes we uh, talk about that, saying what do you think about this chart, etc. So as you see here, everything is related, you know, uh, for their uh, attention. So I use several uh, platforms because students are on several platforms. The aim is to catch the students wherever they are, or to make you interesting so that they attend the class more. So they say, maybe they think, oh, let's go to the class. Maybe she will say something different, interesting. She will show something funny today. So that's the interesting. So that's the, you know, that's uh, three main, you know, like a Flipboard, Pocket, and uh, Pinterest are the three main uh, uh, tools that I use in every semester. So um, every other semester, I use some different tools. For example, one, uh, it requires some effort to uh, do that, but the uh, product is very good. I mean, like the output is very fruitful. So the ad, ad puzzle, I love this. You can create video quizzes. That's a, you know, it's a great, uh, great platform. So. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can still hear you. Yes, oh, okay. yes we can. Uh, okay, all right. Yes, we can. Something here. Okay, all right. So at Puzzle, you create a free uh, teacher account. You have a limited space. You have to earn space, but that's enough. You know, you can delete uh, things and create news. Uh, here is this the school. You should uh, affiliate with a school. So this is, if you look at that, that's my content here. That's I created this uh, this this uh, video quizzes by now. So how it works? Like for example, um, let's go to this to this icon sales. Yeah. So you click on that. Here is the video from YouTube. So here you use another another you know platform YouTube. The YouTube app. Um, it doesn't show. Okay, connected. I mean, I connect the YouTube platform with my ad puzzle, and also I connect YouTube platform with my slides. I mean, I show a lot of videos to the students. So here, what they do, they watch the you know uh, this uh, this this video, and I put there, and uh, they must watch the video. That is the requirement. I tell the ad puzzle, I tell the platform. So when they come to that uh, backwards drop sign, then let's look. And it, oops, I, I missed it. It will stop, see? There, I put the question. The, you can put the questions anywhere. I just put the question there. It is some questions that I developed by myself just watching the, uh, watching the video. So it takes a lot of time because of that. So 
the students, you know, rewatched or take something like next question. For this part, I just developed three questions, for example. So, and then the uh, video continues and at the end, it's apparently there are other questions. So this is one tool, one cool tool. And here you can see, you know, the, uh, the, the, the development, the grading, for example, here. Um, okay, here, that's the, you see all the uh, achievements, students by students, then I, you know, like I put this course into the uh, D2L. So this platform is uh, in accordance, works in accordance with some uh, D2L Blackboard uh, platform. And it doesn't work with uh, the platform that my uh, university has, and that, uh, where I, the university where I work at, but you know, like it's a it's a, it's a good uh, good platform. I mean, it's worth to uh, take some a couple of uh, maybe effort efforts. So how you find the uh, videos? You know, like um, usually you use the uh, um, YouTube videos, and here it's so simple. You just click on that link, and you click it there. Search content. Um, I have that. Okay, search content. And here we are. This is the video. So it says cut. I always cut because there are some advertisements uh, at the beginning. And then you can put their questions. You have two options, but that's enough. Multiple choice uh, works great. So you click on it. You type your uh, question, add answer choices, whatever uh, choice you wanna uh, make it uh, right choice, you click on that or this, this is, and finish. Here we are. That's your video quiz is ready. So I, I, I uh, made a survey by students whether they liked the Ed puzzle. The video quiz, they said, yeah, it's a great idea. I mean, it's interesting and it's, 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 it's not boring. You know, we always give this uh, quizzes in multiple choice quizzes in our uh, D2L or in class on a paper, paper form format, but this is something different and it is, it is appreciated by the, you know, uh, students, I want to say. So again, like Ed Puzzle is connected to the YouTube, like um, Flipboard is connected to Pocket, Pocket is connected to Pinterest, and Facebook is connected to General Class, and Ed Puzzle is connected to YouTube. So you are organized. You know, it's you know, it's like it's it, you you don't get confused, and students get confused. Another platform that I want to share with you is Padlet. I love this platform. Again, you have, you know, limited space. If you use free one, you just have the three Padlet, three boards. So I delete <laughs> if I need to do, uh, I delete one of them if I need to create another one. So. This is a great tool for the class discussion, like interactive class discussion. And the um, great, one of the great uh, feature of this uh, platform is students don't need to, uh, don't need to sign, sign up for this platform. Because you know, if you force, if you tell the students sign up for something, they usually don't do that because they don't want to um, take time and make extra effort to do one more thing. So I always avoid that. Here, our aim is to make the students life easier so that they can stay focused on our class. So here, I mean, like I say, uh, I, I show this, 
students uh, two days near, for example. That was a uh, class act um, activity. So you can change the background. I tell students like, you go to the uh, now, right now in the class, you uh, go to the relevant sources. For example, Wikipedia is not a relevant source from my perspective. It has to be Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, etc., and post on this wall today's news related to international business. It has to be related to international business. And I don't want to have politics. I don't want to have Trump, for example, there. They know that too. So like just companies or countries. And then as you see here, I tell them, because they don't sign up, you don't see their names. But I told them, just put your name here. This is Logan. Put your name there. And they put here today's news. After a while, maybe 30 minutes later, we discuss this news. That's very interactive, very interesting. And everybody learns about that. And here we are, we learned something. So they, this today's news are usually connected to the chapter what we discuss. And I tell the student, see what you pay as a tuition worth it. Because what you learn here from the textbook is not uh, trivial. It's, it is connected to the real world. You are so cool right now because you know one more thing. So you can share it with everybody. So like, so motivation speech is also important. Ilke, I have a question here. Do you use also, do you encourage them to look at international newspapers? You know, uh, in the past they've used in news, international newspaper assignments. The student uh, became a country consultant and kept on with the major publication uh, business publication uh, of that of that country and report it back to the class. I mean, uh, so does this work uh, in a similar way, but made much easier? Yes, I, I do that too. But I don't do I, I don't do that every semester. You know, because they are talking to each other. I don't want that the spring semester students know what to do. I mean, uh, in advance. So if I do that this semester, fall semester, fall uh, 2020, I do that again, maybe spring 2022, like that. I mean, I skip. Yes, I do that too. For that, I tell them, go to the, you know, it's, it's, it's um, podcast, uh, maps. Um, I, so, um, where is this? Newspapers. I tell them, uh, go to this, you know, especially this paper boy is a great, great source. Go to the paper boy or like BBC, you know, BBC has that platform or IMF, etc. Go there and find, you know, like uh, find news from the local newspaper. So one activity I do is compare the local uh, the news for, uh, from the local newspaper with the news from the international newspaper, but the same, the same topic. You know, that is a very interesting activity because students say, oh, wow, they, this is a different, you know, uh, different information, different, you know, uh, like uh, different perspective from each other. That's also uh, very interesting. Okay, that's the Padlet. So um, then I also use, you know, I'm trying to do by myself too, but I'm working on my coding skills. So <laughs> like I, to improve that, I enrolled the master uh, program at Georgia Tech University. I also do that right now. So business analytics. So I also wanna, uh, I mean, like, uh, provide them some games. So trivia games, I managed to do, to quote this by myself. This is my, uh, my website for uh, such things. So like, if you click on that, like this is, you know, like trivia games so that they can enjoy, for example, if you say domestic business is wrong, 
it says the correct answer was cr uh, cross border business. It says wrong and you skip next. You know, it's like, um, um, it's like for a from investment abroad, correct, it's like that. So for each chapter, I created like 10 questions, 11 questions, so that students can enjoy this uh, class and learn more. And then I also created Jeopardy, Jeopardy games, but this is a platform. So I couldn't manage to code this by my side, hopefully in the future. So crossing the fingers. <laughs> So this is, I found the uh, platform. This is uh, Jeopardy Labs, Play Tactile. So um, I put all the questions by myself. It's like flashcards, but it's a fun way. So you click on like play now. And then um, how many teams? Yeah, click one. No, because it's not. So and then you pick your icon, it's fun, you know, it's like, oh, uh, now I'm gonna learn with an, an uh, with a, with a uh, pineapple. So, like I created, you know, this uh, chapters, for example, you click on the globalization 200, technologically broking is defined as. So here, you know, students, like, as I say, it's a flashcard, actually, um, quiz uh, herself or himself, then, um, See answer, it is the answer is here. And if the students knew that, then it click on plus. So it's like, you know, I mean, you can't say, oh, that, that's the same thing with the, with the flashcard, flash but it's interesting, it's different. It's more colorful, let's say. I mean, some students may like it. So I spent time, yes, I spent time for that and did that. So the last thing that I, used, I created actually, or I came up with the idea, this semester is Microsoft, Microsoft OneNote. And I'm going to show it in the, on the uh, website, but app works better, of course. Yeah, so yeah, let's I, try to wrap up, uh, maybe yeah. one more minute. Yeah, that is course diary, my course diary. And students, you know, put, uh, put this is one from one student. Put a, for each chapter, they put their what I learned, study habit, contribution, and at least two questions. That is di my course diary for every uh, chapters. So um, that's it. So I can talk more and more. But thank you very much for listening to me. I hope it was uh, useful. Yilke, thank you so much. I mean, you really need to give us a tutorial, maybe a half a day tutorial. Uh, uh, you have been so innovative, incorporated so many of these social media tools into your class, T, and, and I'm sure uh, the students uh, react very favorably and uh, uh, certainly enhances engagement mm -hmm. and, and makes the course uh, fun. International business should be a fun course. It's not only relevant to everyone, uh, but also it should be a, a fun course to learn engaging course to learn. So, so much, thank you so much. And, and your you. handout will be in the packet as well. Uh, I see a lot of uh, thumbs up here as well. So people are thanking you for uh, all the experience that you have shared. We will now turn to Gary Knight, last but not least. And uh, Gary will focus mostly on teaching online, something that we're doing uh, these days. So Gary, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Well, thank you very much, uh, Tom Air, and I'm, I'm uh, really happy to be here with everyone today. My name is Gary Knight, as Tom Air said, I'm, and I'm a professor at Willamette University in the state of Oregon in the United States. And I am uh, teaching via Zoom uh, this semester, and I have uh, done so uh, previously as well. And it's been a learning curve uh, I'm sure it has been for others uh, as well. And I know that many in the audience have been teaching online or remote uh, uh, online education uh, this term or in prior terms. And so I know that you also have, uh, you have a lot of knowledge and perhaps uh, I'll, we'll try to keep time at the end here for, or even during this presentation 
for everyone, anyone to chime in, to give their thoughts and tips as well on teaching uh, via the, these, this platform. But we really are at the beginning of a new, a brave new world. And it's, uh, these are technologies that I'm sure that we will be using going forward in some form or fashion to enhance, to improve the effectiveness of our teaching in the classroom. Let me just go ahead here and share my screen, which uh, you, you, hopefully you can see. Uh, um, and um, so uh, my topic today is indeed best practices and the online IB course. So let me get going here. Um, we know that students today have different uh, distinctive characteristics, among which are dynamic attention spans, a tendency to multitask. Uh, I think we've all experienced this in the classroom. They learn via high-tech devices, of course. They prefer to stay connected via social media. And also, I could mention that they are they have gone through some interesting experiences in their lives, not least being the major recession that we had about 10 years ago, and then most recently the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and so in a very large sense, they are, they're very realistic in their thinking. Uh, to some extent, family sizes certainly in the United States are smaller, and oftentimes people come from single parent households or rather uh, uh, households with, well, they come from single parent households, which has its own implications, but they also may come from households which they are, in which they are the only child. And so consequently, all of these factors give rise to unique characteristics, special characteristics that to some extent we need to accommodate in the classroom. We did a survey recently at my school and we surveyed actually MBA students uh, and 71 responded at about a 75% response rate. And we asked them, how are you feeling about the online experience? And about 65%, about two thirds of the students said that they were satisfied with the online experience and that they thought that, uh, you know, given particularly the circumstances, I think they're a little forgiving that things seem to be going well but also unfortunately, uh, a large proportion of students said that they are somewhat less engaged in the online classes. And we can imagine why this would be true. There's more distractions in the background. Uh, there's just more things for them to do. Sometimes <laughs> students uh, come from uh, very small homes, maybe they're living on campus. And so there's more, uh, there's less, less privacy, more things going on in the background, or they're just more given to uh, creating their own distractions when they know that they're not a, in an online or in an in an in-person traditional classroom and are not necessarily uh, facing the same types of peer pressure and other pressure that they that they face uh, in a traditional classroom. And so we, we we received comments like I'm having a harder time paying attention amidst all the distractions in my home. Uh, these italicized comments here are in fact uh, real student comments. Uh, a student said, I'm having, having the face-to-face -face classroom experience is important to my learning. And so these are things that we need to be mindful of. 74% uh, of students in the survey indicated that they expect to learn less than they would via in-person classes. So given the special characteristics of today's students combined with the fact that if you are teaching via the Zoom platform, we should expect that we have to do things differently uh, today. And so, uh, in fact, I am teaching, uh, as I said, via Zoom. And this is also known, by the way, as distance education or distance learning, online remote education and so forth. Some are using Microsoft Teams. Some are using uh, Google Classroom and maybe some others are using other platforms. What I would say rule number one for success in such a teaching environment is to keep it simple and cost effective. And I say this because uh, the simpler you keep it, the less likely you are to have technological glitches and other problems. But also uh, some of our students come from, uh, not just me, but I think everyone 
we have students, uh, some proportion of whom come from lower income situations and they may not uh, be able to afford uh, even computers um, or uh, they may not have a situation technologically where they can deal with a lot of bells and whistles. And so that's another reason to keep it simple and keep it cost effective. I think we have to understand that circumstances are special today and therefore some students may have trouble focusing, as I said, due to the things going on in the background. Uh, but by the same token, we need to keep students accountable for attending, but it is important for us to be understanding in this environment and treat students uh, accordingly. I record my Zoom sessions. I think many people do this. Sometimes it occurs automatically at your school so that students can watch the class again or watch it later. And this is particularly important if there's a lot of distractions uh, in their background or perhaps they're working part-time or something of that nature. And I think very, very important, perhaps more important than anything else in the online environment is that we need to keep things more interactive and involve the students in more participation uh, because it is just much easier to get distracted and drift away in the online environment. So indeed, I try to keep my classes on the Zoom platform more interactive, and I typically get, spend about one-third of my class time giving lecture, and then two-thirds being interactive through exercises, activities, cases, many cases, and such things which I call pedagogical tools or tools. And I try to encourage questions. I give uh, lots of examples. Uh, and uh, I think a good strategy for me is to teach the basics of a topic. So for example, let's say that I have a 50 minute uh, typical lecture on foreign direct investment, FDI. Well, I will probably break that. Uh, typically I will break that in two so that I spend maybe 20 or 25 minutes teaching about uh, elements of that topic, FDI, and then I will switch immediately following my lecture to a case or an exercise or some other pedagogical tool that I will use to reinforce that topic. And uh, these tools also are intended to encourage as much as possible discussion and interaction in the classroom. And I know that's not always easy, particularly if you have a large class, but uh, I try to do that. I think we, we are in a time now, in any case, whether you're on the Zoom platform or whether you're doing in-person teaching where more interaction, more discussion in the classroom is best. And this old model of the professor getting up and simply lecturing for the entire class period is probably something we should relegate to, to the past. I think it's important more today than ever before for teaching to be mostly or at least half the time interactive alongside the traditional uh, lecture approach. By the way, uh, we will be sharing our slides uh, uh, for all of these sessions today for those who've attended. And so I'm going to be going through some of this material quickly. So if it looks like uh, you are, there's something that you missed from one of my slides, you'll be able to pick it up later uh, after uh, the, the session today. Um, so yes, I mentioned that I intersperse lecturing Q&A and pedagogical tools as much as I can. Also, uh, something that I've learned, and I'm sure that others are doing this as well, I use three monitors in my teaching. I use the main computer to run my presentation or whatever I'm showing on the, on the screen. And then I also have a second monitor uh, through which I can actually see the students. And I put that right above the camera on my main computer so that I'm actually looking at the students uh, simultaneous to when I'm looking at uh, the camera. And then I also learned that it's very useful to have a third computer uh, that shows the student's perspective. So for all my classes, I sign in 
as if I am a student using my third computer. And I found this is very interesting, or this is very useful because sometimes you will have a technological problem or something happens that you are not necessarily aware of unless you can see the class from the student's perspective. And you can do so if you have uh, an additional, it's not really a third computer because my second computer is actually just a monitor. But if you have a third monitor, which is a computer that you can sign up uh, into class uh, as a, a, from the student's perspective, that allows you to see any problems that arise from the student's perspective that you would not otherwise see. I think that's a very useful uh, approach. So these are the typical order of pedagogical tools that I use. Uh, this sort of goes in order of um, complexity, shall we say. I have the students uh, read the text chapter naturally as they normally would. And then I will give some kind of a lecture in class. And then I will do a mix, not necessarily in every class do I do all of these things, but certainly over the semester, I will do a mix of large cases, Harvard style cases, and then many cases, which I will talk about in detail momentarily, homework exercises, topical exercises on articles from the internet, from uh, websites, from magazines and newspapers and so forth. Uh, and occasionally uh, it's, uh, of course the Zoom environment is quite conducive to bringing in guest speakers because they can be from anywhere in the world, frankly and you can just zoom them in uh, or bring them into whatever platform you're, you're using for them to speak. And uh, also I use uh, videos occasionally. Uh, these are uh, examples of pedagogical tools that I use cases, traditional large cases from the, uh, I use Harvard Business Publishing, but these are typical large cases and I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, many cases, which I'll talk about, homework exercises and topical exercises, which are most usually articles, uh, contemporary articles, for which I write questions that we then discuss in class. So just quickly on traditional cases, these are some of the ones that I really like. Um, Oli Rosella in Bangkok is written by a friend of many of ours, Hemant Merchant, I think he's based there in Florida, who uh, it's about a young woman who has moved to Bangkok uh, and uh, she is experiencing all of the cultural dimensions that that implies. Uh, she's moved there for a job and so it's a way to kind of review on the ground dimensions of culture in a given country. And uh, yes, indeed, uh, Tamer has mentioned on chat. This is another advantage, by the way, of having a second or third monitor is that I can look up here and see what, what's coming in on my chat. And Tamer is mentioning that uh, GSU has webinars on teaching and we also have the pedagogical newsletters that I will mention later. Um, other cases that I like include Competing with Dragons, Amazon in China, Puma's Challenge to Maintain Leadership, I'll mention that, and some others. One of my favorite cases of all time is CFW Clinics in Kenya, which is about essentially a chain of, this is a real case about a, uh, an American actually who, using a franchising model, uh, launched a chain of, I think they're now about 60 of these small clinics located around Kenya using a franchising model. And it's a way for an NGO to use a business model to launch and run a needed service. Uh, Kenya uh, needs uh, more health care. Uh, many places, many countries in the world need more health care. And he's using, the CEO is using a franchising model, a business model in order to launch it. Uh, and uh, it's proving to be very effective. Let me move on now and give you some examples of a couple of many cases that I use. And I use a slightly, a slight variation on this uh, from what you may have seen before. Uh, this is actually a case that Tamer Caviskill wrote several years ago and actually, some of you might be aware that Tamara and I and John Riesenberger have a textbook in international business. And this is at the end of one of the chapters there. 
uh, but that's naturally the book that I use. But basically, you can get short cases from anywhere. And this is a case uh, about a typical company that is launching its product in, uh, it's starting to sell via an exporting model, its food products in Europe. And then what I do for these cases, which is different, a little bit different from what we, uh, what you would ordinarily find, is I will create multiple choice questions like these at the end of the case. Uh, and I, as I, as the students read the case, I distribute these multiple choice questions. And actually, I allot time in class for students to read the case, and then they, we will also take time to go through these questions, these type of questions in class that I have created for my own class. And these questions, I have designed them so that actually all of these answers or most of these answers are typically a correct answer. But then what I do is I use a kind of an in-class polling approach where, for example, let's take question number two. Uh, Philip Austin chose exporting. This is a typical case and a typical question that you would, you would address in any case. And I think this is a question that you would recognize typically. The protagonist in this mini case is a man named Philip Austin, and he has chosen exporting as the firm's main entry strategy for Europe. Exporting may or may not be the best approach given Barrett's circumstances. If you were in charge, which of the following entry strategies would you choose? And again, this is a, these are questions that students have time in class to answer and to contemplate. And then uh, when we actually discuss the case in class, I will poll the class actually orally, verbally, and I will ask them, okay, how many of you chose answer A, exporting? And then I will make note of that on the board that, you know, whatever, six students chose answer A. How many of you chose B, FDI? And then I will note that on the board, you know, 12 students chose FDI. How many chose C and how many chose D? Well, actually, all of these answers are potentially correct. And the purpose of this model, of this approach, is not to get at the correct answer per se. And it's definitely not to penalize or reward students for getting the right answer. Rather, the approach here is that I have written these questions and so that all of these answers are potentially correct. But then what I do in the course of discussing the case is that we go around the room and I say, okay, those of you who chose answer A, exporting, why did you choose answer A? And then the students have to defend and explain why they think that exporting is the best strategy for Barrett in Europe. Or why did you chose, choose answer B? And then they have to explain why they chose foreign direct investment and so forth. And the end result is that we have a very robust discussion in the classroom on the differences between exporting, FDI, joint venture, et cetera, as possible entry strategies for a real world firm. Uh, here's another example uh, of a case that we have uh, international Financial Management at Tektronix, and it's, it's for the chapter on international finance. Uh, and here again, this is just the opening couple of paragraphs on the, on the case. And then here again, I have written my own multiple choice questions for this case. And uh, we can just look at, for example, question two. Suppose the name of the company is Tektronix, and they, they go by the abbreviation Tech. Suppose that Tech's subsidiary in Germany needs $5 million to expand its warehouse and distribution facilities there. All else being equal, which of the following is the best source of funds? And some students, again, here again, I will poll the class uh, orally on how many of them answered each of answers A, B, C, or D. And then we will go through systematically and I will say, so for those of you who chose answer A, why did you choose answer A? And then we will discuss that answer. Uh, what is the efficacy and, and so forth of borrowing money from international banks? Uh, or uh, for example, uh, D, choice D, use tech's own intra-corporate financing. 
uh, is actually an important financing method for multinational firms that many people are not familiar with. And uh, by many students will, having read the case and having read the chapter, choose answer D. And this gives us an opportunity in class, particularly from the students who have chosen that answer to discuss that option for financing. And so uh, in a very discussion oriented, very interactive format, we're able to go around the classroom and students themselves explaining to their peers why they chose this or that uh, solution for their firm. And that gives us a chance. Again, I think it's a, it's a great teaching tool for the classroom. Uh, we also do homework exercises. This is an example of what we actually call a management skill builder, selecting a site for a factory uh, that uh, we created, uh, Tamer and John Riesenberger and I. And uh, this involves uh, a, a real world scenario. We have numerous such exercises, management skill builders, in which in this particular instance, you assume that as a manager, you're working for a firm uh, and you're, uh, you're, say it's American Standard, and you are tasked with identifying a location, a country in Eastern Europe where you could potentially build a factory to manufacture sinks and bathtubs and so forth. And then uh, I give them resources that they can use in the context of the exercise where they can do the research. And then their task is to identify two countries and compare and contrast them on various dimensions like the level of political risk, the cost of labor, the level of labor productivity and so forth. And the point here is to give the students real world experience as much as you can in doing an actual activity that real managers would do when they are researching uh, a given location for uh, performing a given value chain activity, in this case, a, a factory. So we have uh, numerous type exercises like this. Uh, and um, articles, articles are very topical, are very useful. For example, a recent article that has come out in the last couple of years, this is actually featured in one of our pedagogical newsletters is from the Brookings Institute, a global tipping point, half the world is now middle-class or wealthier. And so in my classes, I create questions to go along with this article. We read the article out of class or we can take time in class to read the article. And then I have questions here that students uh, that essentially form the basis for discussion in the class. How does the article define middle-class? Uh, what are the factors, what factors do you believe have allowed people to rise up out of poverty around the world and so forth. It's very interesting and very topical and I think students find it quite interesting. Uh, here's another one uh, that is actually a work in process just to give you the idea that yes indeed you have to create these uh, exercises yourself using topical articles because there's new trends, new phenomena uh, new news that's happening all the time. And so I'm creating a short article based on this long academic article that I wrote uh, a couple of years ago on additive manufacturing. And the topic here is the fourth industrial revolution. And one of the dimensions of the fourth industrial revolution is the rise of additive manufacturing, otherwise known as 3D printing. And that has a lot of interesting implications for international business which are great fodder for classroom discussion. Now, I should just take a minute here and mention as uh, others have to Marin John, uh, the pedagogical newsletter site that uh, Tamer has established at Georgia State University there in the AIB Southeast region, but it's available for anybody around the world. There's the website. Uh, John Riesenberger and Tamara Kaviskill and I and other colleagues have written uh, now so far 12 pedagogical newsletters on various topics. There you can see the website, uh, but most recently we have created these pedagogical newsletters on teaching international business during the coronavirus time, uh, you know, global megatrends, 
uh, energy and international business, uh, the fourth industrial revolution, rise of the middle class and so forth. There you see the website again. Uh, you can also find this, as I mentioned, by just simply Googling pedagogy newsletter GSU cyber. And the reason we have written these newsletters is to provide colleagues around the world with uh, various topical exercises and activities and articles and videos that we have researched and uh, that allow you to maybe bring uh, current enhancements to the classroom. And we're doing this as a service to our colleagues. And so uh, there you have it. I hope you will visit that site. Just last thing that I want to mention here is that this is the AIB Southeast uh, Conference. And uh, it so happens that I'm actually the chair of the AIB World 2021 Conference taking place in the end of June, early July next year in Miami. And I just wanted to mention this to you that this conference is now up on the AIB World website. There you can see the, the website. AIB World Events 2021. And uh, so we will, our conference theme this year is Disruption, Megatrends and Transformation, Reimagining International Business in a Changed World. And so I wanna be sure to invite everyone to the conference. We have actually extended uh, this year's deadline to January 15th in light of the COVID crisis, uh, just because things are a little bit unusual this year but the annual conference, the big conference of the AIB will be taking in the Southeast US region uh, next year in uh, Miami. Uh, we have 14 tracks, uh, including the local track, which is building bridges to emerging markets in the new global class, as well as the conference track, which was created in light of the COVID crisis that is afflicting the world right now, but also to address major mega trends in the world like these here, technological change, demographic shifts, urbanization, and so forth. Well, I guess I've used up all the time here, uh, but thank you very much. If you have any questions or thoughts, there's my email address. Thank you very much. And thank you, Gary. That was outstanding. It's amazing how much information packed in there and best practice. Really appreciate it, Gary. And I'm just so amazed. We uh, stuck to the two hour available to us and we are educators. I mean, we uh, professors <laughs> normally don't, don't accomplish uh, that, but it's been, uh, it's been very informative. I learned a lot and I really appreciate uh, everybody's uh, input here. Uh, I don't know if we have any few, few minutes to, uh, for questions and answers and comments. Uh, I know there's another session that will start. Uh, so uh, folks, if you have anything, uh, just uh, let us know. If we don't have time today, just drop us an email. As we mentioned, we will assemble uh, all of our resources. Uh, tremendously helpful, I think. I'm looking forward to Ilke's handout, for example, uh, and, and, and share them with you. Uh, so. Uh, and we can see, Tom Air, that even cats are attending the conference. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Anne Marie, <laughs> she's keeping you company there, hopefully. <laughs> Excellent. So, um, uh, with that, uh, David, uh, uh, what do you think? Uh, where do we have time? So uh, again, I think we shared with you uh, the webinar uh, a week from today at 11 a.m. Eastern time uh, on, on student-centered uh, syllabi. And, and I really look forward to that. Uh, Elizabeth and Sarah are here. Do you wanna make any comments on what to expect? Because you, this, you, you put together this session together with John and uh, I have been outside of it, outside of the process. I normally uh, inquire, but tell us what to expect. Um, well, John actually hit on a few of the things that we'll be talking about, but um, we'll also be showing you um, our versions of actual syllabi that are more interactive and uh, you know, uh, encouraging ways and showing you ways 
on how to engage a little bit better with your students to discover what their goals are and how to align them with uh, the learning outcomes of the course. S Sarah and Elizabeth will both be showing videos of student reactions Great. To, to their new syllabi. Yeah, so I went ahead and I, um, I've been using the tools that we've been talking about. So I've received very, very good feedback from my students already. So I have a couple testimonials that I'll be sharing in our session next week as well. And I have to say, I was actually very surprised at how effective changing the syllabus and making it more student um, centered and also more visual actually had such a positive effect on my students and, and their opinion in the class as well. Excellent. We look forward to that. The next two uh, issues of the newsletter, by the way, will focus on Africa. Murat, who was here with us, uh, is putting together that newsletter. And also uh, global competency. Uh, Leanne Liu, one of our colleagues, who is an expert on uh, global competence, uh, will, will uh, prepare that one. So I'll look forward to that one. The last one was on South America. We got a lot of good feedback from uh, colleagues who are trying to diversify their examples because in international business, we have perhaps too many examples and cases and illustrations from China or India. We like to diversify and, and, and show our students what's happening in other parts of the world, certainly Africa, Murad, you're working on that next issue. Yes. Uh, yes, and I'll be working on uh, resources for faculty. So I'll include uh, seminal articles, uh, reports. Uh, African Development Bank has done some amazing studies uh, on Africa there. Focus on the major five economies, Egypt, uh, South Africa, Nigeria, uh, Algeria, Morocco, and also uh, Ethiopia. Uh, just focus on country capsules. And I also will have videos, as I said, cases, and uh, a number of tools and simulations that are focused on Africa. So hopefully uh, instructors and professors that uh, deal with Africa will find this helpful. And still another issue will be on uh, teaching international business uh, with video source uh, resources, various videos, not just our cyber, but a few other cybers that put together. So you'll look forward to that one as well. Uh, so I think uh, we've, uh, I think I feel I feel good about what I heard. Uh, I was I am inspired. Uh, I, I really appreciate everybody's participation here. If there are some uh, final comments or questions, uh, please go ahead. Otherwise, we'll uh, say goodbye to you for the session, and we'll see you at another session. Certainly, I mentioned Ahmed was our session tomorrow at 11 a.m. Thank you. Thanks, Tamar. Okay. Thank you so much. You all have a great afternoon. Okay, you Thank too. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you, Thanks again Stuart. for your time. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.